Hey everyone, Rob Ryder on Sunday, August 25th, 2013. Um, here recently we've been taking, since the church and state are apparently separated, and looking at both societies because they're both considered perfect societies. And a society is the same as, say, in a nation. And since if you were baptized, you are already in the church, well, then you should be able to claim the citizenship in the church as part of the Holy See, because it is its own perfect society. Uh, get your instruments of your office that were given to you uh, under the uh, Pontifical Council for the Laity, and uh, commissioned go out and speak in the name of the Lord to spread the gospel to all nations. Um, so that's the church, right? It's its own society. Those people in the church are in a society. It's a nation. As a Christian, you could be part of that Christian nation. If you were had your citizenship papers. But we don't. And I, and I started to read about this, and it was talking about this particular thing, that within the Holy See, all, really all there are are clerks, clerics, which is what a priest is. He's a cleric, which is another name for a clerk. But over here on the state side, what we think of as the United States of America and so forth, it's the exact same thing. You don't have citizenship papers for the United States of America either. You may be a, natu a Native American, but that doesn't make you a citizen of the United States of America. We don't have citizenship papers. We're stateless in both the state and the church. So I'm trying to claim my citizenship in the church because I would rather have that be my domicile than the state. Because it's your domicile that determines what form of law you can be tried under. And so if somebody has a claim against you, they have to bring it into the forum of your domicile. And in the church, if somebody wants to bring a claim against you, they have to swear to it and bring forth two witnesses. Now those witnesses could be sheets of paper under notary seal, because she did it as a witness. It's been witnessed. Right? But that isn't what we find in the state. In the state, they just put in whatever they want to, and they just seem to go by some kind of custom that we're not catching on to. Yeah, but maybe we are now, because we've been going to the wrong branch. We should be going to the executive branch. But I'm going to cover that in another video. This is the church side, because some interesting things have been happening. Um, just little pieces. Well, let's see if we can make a picture out of all this. I, I think it's quite uh, quite godly. Heaven sent. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So, in my opinion, it seems like the Queen of Heaven is about to step on Satan's head. When words matter, it's good to see what the Vatican has to say. So, what happened in the first place, right? Adam was supposed to be the keeper of the garden, and Adam is the one who let the serpent into the garden, because he was afraid of the serpent. And he stood right next to Eve when the serpent offered Eve the apple, and he didn't stop it. Adam was the problem. He didn't keep the garden. And Eve took a bite of the apple. Well, what the Queen of Heaven is going to do is she's not going to bite the apple. She's going to step on Satan's head. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. It ain't going to happen again. The woman is not going to bite the apple. The woman's going to crush the head of the snake. And the woman is the church, right? The, 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 um, the, the Catholic Church, the universal church of Jesus Christ, the Queen of Heaven is Virgin Mary. She was made queen of the Catholic Church. At the foot of the cross, when she said, when Jesus said, to, Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And he was talking to the Apostle John. He had just turned over the disciples of his to her care as her the mother, us the sons and daughters. So, so what's happened? Well, since July, they announced changes in the criminal code and defined who they apply to, including public officials. Vatican City State has worldwide jurisdiction because both claims jurisdiction over all baptized people. And we're going to see how we just enforced that, even made it even stronger. But all this has already been recovered. I did a video called Rapture Starts September 1st, 2013. Put that in the YouTube search. I'm sure you'll find it. And, you know, we'll talk about what happened in July. <sighs> and the Vatican just made perfectly clear 
as evidence below by way of press release that the Vatican has just changed the text for a baptism. They've changed the text for baptism to emphasize that the sacrament of baptism formally brings a person into the Church of God and not just into a local Christian community. In other words, you, anybody who's been baptized is a Catholic. Whether they like it or not, the Pope claims jurisdiction. If you've had a valid baptism, you are Catholic. Anyone baptized proper form of matter is a member of the Catholic Church, as in the Universal Church, and under the jurisdiction of the Pope as the Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church. It's just the way it's set up. And we're going to want that to we're going to want to use that to our advantage because these people in these courts are mostly baptized, yet they're transgressing God's law. So boom, right? They have a problem with the Pope. <clears throat> But it gets better. Uh, here, just recently, a priest in France was excommunicated for being a Freemason. And he's going to walk 900 kilometers, that's about 560 miles, walk, from where he is to Rome to petition the Pope for reinstatement. Apparently, he found out what it means to be excommunicated, and he's willing to walk 560 miles to beg forgiveness. We'll talk about more about that recently. But... A priest was excommunicated for being a Freemason. The reason the priest was excommunicated is because he's a freaking Christian, not because he's a priest. <laughs> Any Christian who's a member of a Freemason society is excommunicated ipso facto by the fact that he is a Freemason, he's excommunicated from the church, which means he doesn't have any church property anymore, and the church property, in my opinion, is whatever is in your all-capital-letter name estate. It's considered church property. Your church, right? Your little body is a church. You're part of the baptized into the church. So you were given an inheritance by God. That's been growing, and that's what they're keeping you from having, right? It's your accumulated grace. It's nothing to do with money. It has to do with grace. Now, the Vatican has written over 20 bulls about Freemasons, and that any Catholic, not just priest, that joins this or any other secret society requiring worship of false idols, renounces Jesus Christ as the path to salvation, swear a curse on themselves, are excommunicated ipso facto. You know, I didn't know that much about Freemasons. I mean, I knew a little bit, but if you just go in, into YouTube and put in something like Freemasons in the church and just watch some of the videos other people have done, it's, it's quite astounding. Um, so, you know, while they think they're swearing an oath, what they're actually swearing is a curse on themselves. Because they're taking an oath that no matter what their brother Mason does, they're going to keep it a secret. Well, that would be a sin if your brother just broke one of God's laws. And you saw it and you stayed silent. That's a curse on yourself. And then you curse yourself by saying that if you do tell somebody, well, then they should just come and take your bowels out. And then, uh, and so they take anybody of any religion, they put, you can swear at any book you want to, right? So all books are equal as far as the Masons are concerned. Well, as a Christian, you can't accept that, right? Only one book has got the inspired word of God in it, and that's the Bible. I'm sorry about the rest. As a Christian, that's the one that matters. I'm not talking about the rest of you. So a Christian can't be a Freemason. If he is, he can be excommunicated. If he's excommunicated, he's going to lose his estate. He's going to lose, he's going to become stateless. And there was a guy that, you know, I heard the story, I read the story, I know other people have heard it, that he had gone to an archbishop somewhere, and he told the archbishop he wanted to get out of the system. And the bishop said, no, you don't. He said, I really do. Well, you really don't want to do that. Yes, I do. Well, boom, next day he was stateless. He didn't have any bank account. No driver's license. He didn't show up in anything, apparently. Couldn't find him, right? I think that's what happened to this priest. And it can happen to any Christian who's a member of a secret society, be he a judge, a politician, um, a policeman, a fireman, whomever. Your banker, doesn't matter. Attorneys, boom. Christian, Freemason, excommunication, become stateless. But we need to let the Pope know that, hey, this guy I think is a Freemason. 
although he knows who they are. So if they're holding an ecclesiastic office, like a magistrate, judge, attorney, notary, commission officer, etc., in an ecclesiastic society, and constitutions are ecclesiastic ordinances, so they are in an ecclesiastic society, like the state of Michigan, whatever, then they should immediately quit the position or face the thunderous wrath of the Vatican, because the Vatican's the one who authorizes those offices to be there. The Vatican claims jurisdiction over the entire world. Right? I don't know exactly how it's set up. I just know that they say they do, and if they really want to, they can enforce it. Problem is, they may not know this. That's all these people, right? Because Catholic priests are Freemasons. Some of the Vatican are Freemasons. Baptist, Baptist churches have Masonic symbols on them, right? They got this placard in the corner. It's got the Masonic symbol on it. But then so does the Anglican Cathedral in Toronto. It's built into the stained glass. And it's very, very telling, right? Because you got all this beautiful stained glass in this cathedral all over the place. And there in the corner, at the bottom of one of the panes is the symbol of the Freemasonry and the stained glass. To me that represents the leaven of the heretic, of the Pharisee. That one little piece of leaven get in the church, it's going to ruin the whole dough. That's why they got to go. And also covered, I'm going to tell a little bit about Fatima and Guadalupe, um, and then this. But now, thanks to the release of the Holy See of an official bulletin titled, uh, whatever it is, it was confirmed that the papal conclave that elected Pope Francis, March 13, heard a message immediately before the voting from a senior cardinal dealing directly with the threat of the smoke of Satan descending on the Vatican itself. And the first time those words were said, apparently, was back with uh, Pope Paul VI, about 1963-64, no, maybe it was 72 he said it. I think he said it in 72. It was after um, Vatican II when he wrote this encyclical, some kind of whatever they called it, talking about the smoke of Satan had entered the church. Vatican itself. He's talking about Freemasonry. Those Freemason temples are the synagogues of the sons of Satan. I'm not saying most of the members. I'm saying the guys at the top the synagogue of the son of Satan and no Christian has any has any reason to be in any secret society at all right there are no secrets you're going to tell the truth let your yay be yay let your nay, nay be nay so what happened well on August 22nd the Vatican ordered a slight change to the text for baptism to emphasize that the sacrament of baptism formally brings a person into the church of God and not just to a Christian community, the Vatican has ordered a slight change of wording in the baptism rite. At the beginning of the rite, instead of saying the Christian community welcomes you with great joy, the minister will say the church of God welcomes you with great joy. Now this isn't changing what they meant, they're just clarifying the wording. It's always meant that when you were baptized, you became a brings a person into the Church of God, into the Universal Church of Jesus Christ, into the Catholic Church, which is the Holy See Society that we should have citizenship in. And over there, Christians don't treat each other this way. So we need to be taking our complaints to the Church. Because a Christian, or somebody who says he's a Christian, is number one, he's judging me, sitting up there as a judge, I got another one over here bringing the charge against me. That makes him a false accuser. And I got how many other people in there who are Christians who know that this is all fraud, that it's a simulated legal process, and are allowing it to go on. They're all bearing false witness. It's a bad day for people in the, in the courts. Baptism, the sacrament of faith, of which people are incorporated into the one Church of Christ, which subsists in the Catholic Church, governed by the successor Peter and the bishops in communion with him, said the decree from the Congregation of Divine Worship. Okay, so they're making it very clear if you're baptized the Pope has jurisdiction. The new wording of the decree said better emphasizes Catholic doctrine that through baptism a person is incorporated into the universal church and is not and not just into a parish. It's not something local. This is universal. This goes all the way to Vatican City. The minister who makes clear 
the sacrament is being administered in the name of the church and not just in the name of a local community. Apparently, maybe they hadn't been doing that before. All right, so he they've just def, they just here defined or redefined or enhanced the definition of baptism. All baptized Christians are in the jurisdiction of the Pope. He just said so again. Okay, now this just happened on July nineteenth. A curious clash between French Freemasonry and Roman Catholic Church has emerged after an excommunication of a well liked Catholic priest because he joined the Freemasons while remaining an active parish priest. Now he is sent out on a pilgrimage to Rome on foot. His church superiors, in the shape of the Archbishop, uh, reportedly defrocked him because of his membership with the Grand Orient de France. God F. Go figure. The dismissal, which the bishop's office reportedly described as medicinal, could be reversed if the priest gives up his membership of the lodge. You're going to take a choice. You're going to have the mark of the beast and stay in that uh, Freemason outfit you're at, or you have to come out. Come out of her. It's the horror of Babylon, man. That's who the horror is. It's the frickin' Masons. Uh, he earlier defended his right on the basis of what he did in his free time was his own private business. Although there's 20 papal bulls that say you can't do it, he decided he was going to do it anyways. Uh, and now he's been uh, excommunicated, has set off a plan, 900 kilometer walk, set to take six weeks. I have been the victim of a decadent. A few centuries ago I could have been burnt at the stake as a heretic. You're absolutely right, brother. Now you've just been excommunicated and they took your property. Could have burned your ass as a heretic. The, the, the Masons do not believe any supernatural power on earth. It's all natural. It's five senses only. God doesn't get involved in the world. You become a Shriner which is part of the Masons, when you go and take your oath, again, another curse, you're going to do it on the Quran and uh, give it to Allah. That's what a Shriner does, man. He takes an oath to Allah on the Quran. And so there's many, many good videos on this right now. You know, If you know people that are Masons, go find some you like and say, here, you better watch this, brother. Right? You made a mistake. It's just a mistake. Come on out. right? But either way, If you're a Mason and you say you're a Christian, you were excommunicated ipso facto, and I need to let the Pope know. Uh, temporary excommunication is described as, for medicinal purposes, likens membership in the Freemason Lodge to an illness. It is. It's mental illness. A radicalized anti-Mason discourse that surprises most observers. Yeah. Duh. You mean... There is a God, and He does. There is supernatural powers, and miracles can happen, and people can be cured. And you know, we've been given the power to uh, and the authority to cast out demons, and from persons and places. I think we need to go to these. Let's let's pick on the Masonic lodges first instead of a person. Let's just go to the lodge and stand in front of it and cast the demons out. Or that Baptist church that's got it in the corner, or the Episcopal church that has it, go in there and cast out Satan. A Freemason is led to consider and judging everything from the point of view of Masons. <laughs> judging everything from the point of view of Masons. Forget Christ, just what the Masons think, without even being aware that they are doing so. From this point, to one that holds the God F to be a sect practicing mind control. That it, it is mind control. They put a noose around your neck, make you walk around your underwear, pierce you with a stick, and say, you know, if you tell any secrets, that's just the start. And so this <laughs> Freemasonry was not a mistress hidden from my legitimate wife, the church. I am unaware of any competition or schizophrenia. Well, then you, you're fucking blind, brother. Because there's 20 bulls that say you can't be a Mason. Ah, so anyways, this just goes into what the guy did. He wanted to join a certain lodge, which he did. They had certain views that were outside of the, the church's 
um, uh, beliefs. And so the Vatican's Congregation of Doctrine and Faith sanctioned the priest on March 7, 2013, conveniently during the hiatus between resignation of Pope Benedict and election of his successor, Francis. Okay, well, who cares when they did it? The fact is, they just set up precedents. If you've been baptized into the into the church, you are a priest. We're all priests. If that priest can be uh, um, excommunicated, any priest can be. And so we take it to the Vatican's Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. And what we're trying to do now is, well, how do you take complaints to these places? We may just have to write them directly, because one thing we found is they don't want you to talk to the bishop. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has long condemned members in Masonic, Masonic societies. The diocese dismissal of a Syrian priest refers to the incompatibility of Freemason principles in terms of faith and its moral demands. Right? You're going to keep some guy's secrets if you take this Masonic oath, no matter what he does. You're going to use a secret handshake in, or sign in a courtroom to have a judge give you a, uh, you know, to find in your favor. Well, that's, you know, that kind of shit is breaking commandments. Freemasons, the invisible hand, all three articles go into depth for the alleged links between Masons, politicians, a number of recent scandal, power plays, and general lever pulling. Yeah, because Freemasons, uh, which counts many politicians among its members, including many in the ruling Socialist Party, or in the Democratic Party, or the Republican Party, or judges, or attorneys, or people sitting on commissions, or bankers, or, 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 right? You just need these people in the, in the main positions who are going to keep each other's secrets and say, hey, don't tell I'm committing a fraud. I won't tell you are. Ha, 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 right? That's what, all, that's what all this is about, in my opinion, what's been happening at the Vatican the last few weeks. Um, what else we have here? Ooh. Well, just continue on. So, this is out of Wikipedia, if you want to know. The Vatican has made several pronouncements forbidding Catholics from becoming Freemasons under threat of excommunication. The Church still prohibits members membership in Freemasons, right? Can't be denied. The faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and may not receive Holy Communion. They've been excommunicated. Membership in the Masonic Association remains forbidden. So, none of this is new. Right here. Here's a list of bands that were put on, right? 1751, 1821, 1826, 1829, 1832, 1846, 49, 64, 65, 69, 73, 1884, 1917, explicitly declared joining Freemasons entitled automatic execution. Ipso facto. None of that has changed. You're just not saying it with the same words anymore. The Sacred Congregation of Doctrine of Faith has ruled that Canon 2335 no longer automatically bars Catholics from membership in Masonic groups, and so Catholic who join the Mas Freemason is executed only if the policies and actions of the Freemasons in this area are known to be hostile to the Church. Well, that's what they put out in 1974. But it's been clarified since. Because these bishops in 1980, they went out and looked at the things that the Freemasons believe, that it denies the possibility of divine revelation. The sacramental character of Masonic rituals has was seen as signifying an individual transformation, offering an alternative path to perfection other than Jesus Christ. Right? These are heretic ideas. And so the clarification also affirmed that prohibition against Catholics joining Masonic orders remains in effect. Period. That goes to anybody who's a Christian. And then in 1833, Ratzinger wrote, because he was then uh, on, sitting on as the prefect of the Congregation of Doctrine of Faith, 
The faithful who enroll in Masonic associations are in a state of grave sin and do not and may not receive Holy Communion, and the Church negative judgment in regard to Masonic associations remains unchanged since their principles have always been considered irreconcilable with the doctrine of the Church, and therefore membership them them remains forbidden. Go back and look at Mexico in the 1920s and 30s and see what happened to the Christians when the Masons took over the government. Backed by the United States. It's really horrific. Anyways, so, uh, this is stuff you can read when I send it out, but uh, just more of the same stuff. Uh, apparently you can't be a Mason. I guess that's the point, right? Now this is uh this came out just in the last couple of weeks. And that's where I talked about um the smoke of Satan descending on the Vatican itself. The mediation about that which Christ wants from his church was delivered by uh, Maltese Prosper Greg, an eighty seven year old Augustinian who could not participate in the vote. After his mediation, reports the Catholic online newsletter, he left the Sistine Chapel. He prefaced his remarks by saying, I have no intention of making the identikit of the new pope, and much less presenting a plan of action for future pontiff. This very delicate task belongs to the Holy Spirit, who in recent decades has given us a series of excellent holy pontiffs. My intention is that of drawing from the scripture some reflections to help us understand Christ wants from the church. Talking what he called their characterized as the anti Catholic media, Greg suggested when accusations are false they should not be addressed even if they cause immense pain. However, based with the R, the church needs to be transparent. But in the section of the mediation titled Smoke of Satan in the Church, Greg said the evil spirit of the world, the Mysterium Inequalitis constantly strives to infiltration of the church. Moreover, let us not forget the warning of the prophets of ancient Israel not to seek alliances with Babylon or with Egypt, but to follow a pure policy ex fide, trusting solely in God and in his covenant. Courage, Christ relieves the minds when he exclaims, having trust, I have overcome the world. And then some Father Connor gave a homily titled The Reign of the Antichrist, in which he described how changes in society and in institutions were already at work before his death to provide in the upcoming, uh, the coming of Antichrist. He's talking about Freemasonry. In this sermon and elsewhere, O'Connor outlined the catalyst of this scheme unfolding as a present Masonic conspirators within organizations who plan, called Alta Vendetta, would essentially take control of the papacy and help the false prophet deceive the world's faithful, including Catholics, into worshiping the Antichrist, said Horn. So, one thing that happened in Vatican II is before that, it you know it had been a monarchy in the in the Holy See, and Vatican II made it more like, more like a democracy. And in a democracy, the the way that so. Now it's a constitutional monarchy. Still has a king as a figurehead. That would be the Pope. But the day to day operations is run by the Secretary of State as the Prime Minister. So really it's set up a lot like England is. It's not that the Pope doesn't have jurisdiction of some things, but he was effectively controlled because they set this system up of. Um, a democracy where the government is run by the Secretary of State. And why this is important is there's this thing about uh, the vision of Fatima in 1917, three little children who saw the Virgin Mary and 70,000 others saw the sun dance in the sky and come towards the earth and their clothes were miraculously dried after a tor torrential rain, so was the ground. All sorts of odd, wonderful miraculous things happened on this day, October 13th, I think it was. So, um, where are we going next? So 
so much to talk about. So anyways, um, part of that thing with Fatima is there were supposed to be these three secrets, and the third secret was supposed to be revealed in 1960, and it was never actually revealed. And one of the things that was supposed to happen is the consecration of Russia, and that never happened. But here this October 13th, the Pope is going to have the statue from the shrine in Fatima brought to Vatican City and he's going to consecrate the world. Now is he going to add that he's consecrating Russia? We'll find out, but Pope John Paul apparently said that he consecrated the world and people said well that isn't what the Virgin Mary said so it really wasn't done. But all the official stuff that came out all came out of the Secretary of State's office, not, not from the Pope. Just showing that the Secretary of State is effectively running the Pope. But, you know, the Popes are still doing what the Popes are doing. We'll, we'll, we'll know the backstory later, but this, this stuff has already kind of happened. That uh, um, That the Pope is controlled But the Smoke of Satan reference harkens to even more directly to those to what a close personal friend of Pope Paul VI observed in interviews and in two books he wrote about saying the a satanic super force at work inside the Vatican. Right, we're talking back in the 70s. The, the, the Catholic Church has been saying Satan's in the Vatican. Suddenly they became unarguable that now, the Roman Catholic organization carried permanent presence of clerics who worshipped Satan and liked it, wrote Martin. The fact that brought the Pope into a new level of suffering were mainly two, the systematic organizational links, the networks, in other words, masonry, that had been established between certain clerical homosexual groups and satanic covens, the masons, and inordinate power and influence of that network. It was not. It was what knowledgeable churchmen called superforce. Uh, Martin wrote the most frightening for John Paul. He had come up against the irremovable presence of a malign strength in his own Vatican, and in certain bishops' chanceries. It was what knowledgeable churchmen called the superforce. Rumors always difficult to verify tied its installation to the beginning of Pope Paul the Sixth reign in 1963. Indeed, Paul had alluded soberly to the smoke of Satan, which had entered the sanctuary, in oblique reference to an enthronement ceremony by Satanists in the Vatican. Martin revealed even greater Luciferic enthronement ceremony by Satanists in the Vatican in his book, Windswept House. The encroachment of the fallen angel Lucifer has affected within Roman Catholic Citadel on June 29, 1963, yada yada yada. So anyways, the serpent is back in the garden, right? But this time, the woman's going to step on his head. And so this goes on and on, you know, and listening to different things, reading different things about this particular situation, it comes down to, you know, the way they describe it is that the devil decided it was time to end it, right? Time to have the war. And the war is going on now, and smoke of Satan has entered into the inner sanctums of the Catholic Church and John Paul when he went to Fatima in, uh, I think it was 2000, 2005 2000, he had said that a third of the stars of heaven will be swept away by the tail of the dragon and they've gone on to say what that means is that a third of the you know, the holy, the clerics, whatever, within the church are going to be swept from the sky. Now again, the church is all baptized people. So, a third of them are going away. They're going to be raptured. And even in the West, God will not fail to keep for himself a remnant of Israel that does not bend the knee to before Baal. A remnant that we find mainly in the lay movements endowed with different charisma, charism, charisms that are making a strong contribution to the new evangelization. 
They're talking about us. We need to get out and point out the transgressions. We just need to figure out how that's done. First of all, we need to know that it was a transgression. Now we do. Now you can say to that judge, are you a member of a secret society judge? I have a question for you. Are you a member of a secret society? Are you baptized? Well, you, I excommunicate you, ipso facto. You were, if, you, you were excommunicated from the moment you became a Mason. And you can't hold that ecclesiastic office anymore. You need to remove yourself from the bench. I'm sure he'd blow his top, but, you know, somebody out there, a real faithful dude, might try it someday. Uh, March 2010, some the chief Vatican exorcist told an Italian newspaper, the devil resides in the Vatican, and you can see the consequences. He can remain hidden, or speak in different languages, or even appear to be sympathetic. At times he makes fun of me, but I am a man who is happy in his work. He added the evil influence of Satan was evident in the highest ranks of the Catholic hierarchy, which cardinals who do not believe, or with cardinals who do not believe in Jesus, and bishops who are linked to the demon. Okay, ask the Roman Catholics. You got the same problem with Baptists, Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Seventh day Adventists, and it, all of them, man. They all have the same problem. A lot of those people that are up there preaching at the pulpit are frickin' Masons. And they need to be told, you either leave your Masonic Lodge or I'm going to turn you into the Pope as a heretic. And you're excommunicated. I'm going to blow their top. Alright. So we were trying to do this. Okay, here's what we were trying to do. A few weeks ago, I had written this up, this real short thing, Petition to the Pope, right? And uh, it was Acknowledgement of Papal Decrees, Acceptance of Office. And, and this goes back to earlier videos where it talks about in this particular um, papal bull, uh, the Pontifical Council for the Laity, about a sui juris, juridical personality within the universal church, within the church, has been uh, given to us. Right, so the thing with decrees are they could be interlocutory and final. And I, in my mind, I said, okay, this one that they did is an interlocutory decree, and we need to get the final decree based on that decree, so we need to go ask for it, right? We need to ask for our office. And so we've been trying to uh, figure out how you would petition the Pope. And you wouldn't believe it, but it's really hard to do. <laughs> no one seems to be able to tell you how to do it, although it's every Christian's right to do it. The parish doesn't know how to do it. You go to the parish, and um, they just say, we don't know what to do, right? You need to, go, you need to go to the diocese. So Bobby in Arizona took a letter like this to the diocese with his other evidence, his baptismal certificate and other evidence of he was going to include and he went to the diocese in Phoenix and gave it to him over the counter and they said oh, well, I think this needs to go to Chancery and they put it in an envelope and they said it was going to go to Chancery on it and Chancery got back to him and said hey no such thing exists and no, you know there is no such thing you know you need to go do more research and it came from a judicial vicar and um you know, what are you supposed to do with that? Well, um, so then he said, well then, well then if you can't do it, then go ahead and um, just send it on to the Pope, because it's a petition to the Pope. Right? I'm not really asking you, I'm just trying to figure out how to petition the Pope. All right? so that's why I brought it to the, that's why he had brought it to the diocese, is how do I petition the Pope? Here's my petition, how do I get it to the Pope? Looks like we need to take this to Chancery. Chancery says no such thing and we're not going to send it to the Pope. Well, so Bob told me that and we talked about it. I said, well, shit, let's go ahead and fax a copy to the Archbishop over in Santa Fe. So he called up over there and found out how to do it and, you know, put on their attention Archbishop and make sure, they'll make sure he gets it. He faxed it. He called over there the next day and talked to the secretary. He said, uh, yep, yeah, the Archbishop Bishop saw it, and he says, you need to get a hold of your diocese. 
<coughs> which kind of, you know, boss, well, what's that all about? I've already gotten a hold of my diocese. They're not helping me. But he hadn't actually gotten it to the bishop yet. And so he called and told me that, and we talked some more. I said, well, call him back and say, why don't you guys fax it to the bishop for me? I don't want to spend $15 to fax it again. So he called her up and told her this, and she said, I'd be happy to do that, but the archbishop kept it. So the archbishop has a copy of this for Bob in Santa Fe. And what he had said is he had to get a hold of his diocese. So he's talked to the archbishop, and the archbishop has said, get a hold of your diocese. So Bob says, well, shit. So he does another copy and faxes it, and he puts on there, attention bishop. And he says, okay, I'll just send this one to the bishop. And he sent it, and he's waiting to hear something, you know, a couple, three, four days. He's calling. Nobody's calling him back. He finally gets a hold of the bishop's secretary, and she says, well, I haven't seen it. Well, where did it go to, right? He put it, He sent it to um, the diocese, attention bishop, and the bishop's secretary hasn't seen it. This is five or, you know, four or five, six days after he had faxed it. Who took it, and where did they take it to? Right? I mean, that's there's something going on in the church. They don't want the bishop to see it. And so, um, here just a couple days ago, the, now the bishop's out till Tuesday, so he got a hold of whoever his secretary was, got her name, sent it to her, called her, and yes, she did get it, so hopefully the bishop's going to see it on Tuesday. And now he's going to fax the archdiocese and tell them what's been going on down at this diocese. So they didn't they didn't want to send this up the line is the point, right? They were trying to make a judicial determination in chancery, you know, that there was nothing we, that he was mistaken and so forth and so on. Um and then Roe so that's what happened to Bob. Now in Roe's case she had gone with two of her friends to the Archdiocese in Chicago. And they had gone to the vicar general's office because the vicar is supposed to have the same power as a bishop. He gets his uh, executive authority from the bishop, so it gives him the same power as a bishop. And so she, her and three of her friends went to the archdiocese to see the vicar general, who was out. These people never seem to be in their office, but they did talk to her secretary or his secretary, and Roe read the little decree there to her and said, we're trying to claim our office, whatever, and would you make sure that the vicar general sees us? Which she did. And um, Roe got this letter back here just a few days ago that Bishop Francis Kane, vicar general, so not the bishop of the diocese, but the vicar general, asked I review the document you submitted for yourself at your visit on the 12th of uh, 2013, 12th of August. It's my understanding from these documents you're seeking decrees from the Holy Father that designate each above mentioned individual as faithful a person of Christ. This is an unusual request. By virtue of your baptism in Jesus Christ, you're already named and sent on a mission by him to go forth and teach the good news, making disciples of all nations. You have been given uh, the gift of faith. Your baptismal certificate is an attestation of your status in the church. In accepting the gift of faith, it is hoped that your life will be a reflection of Christ's mission for this church. In my opinion, a decree to establish a special office is unnecessary. Should you wish to pursue another opinion, you may contact uh, the papal nuncio. I hope that this information is helpful and I encourage you to continue faith and serve in the name of the Savior, Jesus Christ, from a judicial vicar. Right? Well, we're not trying to get this to the judicial vicar. Right? Again, these are these are petitions written to the Pope. And if you can't handle it, send it to the Pope. The Vicar General didn't give it to the bishop, he gave it to a he gave it to a judicial vicar. And it went to the judicial branch instead of the executive branch. We were trying to get something executed, not interpreted. I wasn't looking for his opinion, right? I'm looking for somebody to execute the law. Because <laughs> here, right, it says right here, making disciples of all nations. Well, if I'm going to make disciples of all nations, I need some paperwork to get across the border. 
Where's that at? Your baptismal certificate is an attestation to your status in Christ. Okay, well then, where is my identification? If I have the testimony that I am have a status in Christ, I'm a Christy Fieldist, then where's my frickin' identification? To show that I'm in the society, the same society that priest is in. He's there as a clerk. We're supposed to be there as the royalty. We're the rulers. It's only the lay apostolate that can, that can go out by commission, speak in the name of the Lord. Heal the sick, help the poor. You can write the checks. You can do whatever you need to do. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to have access to our states. And it would be through the church because we would get this sui juris legal personality. We have no defects. We, we, we have the same, basically the same status as a bishop as far as a corporate soul where we hold both the equitable and legal title to our church property. And they really don't want us to have this, right? So the vicar general wouldn't give it to the bishop. So wrote, you know, she wrote a little letter to the bishop. And she called down there, and if you want to mail the bishop, you need to send it to a post office box, right? <laughs> Apparently they got to keep the dude's mail separated from everybody else's, or shit may not make it to him. Such as what happened to Bob. He faxed it over, care of the bishop, and four or five days later, the bishop secretary hasn't seen the facts. Well, he had also taken a copy there and given it to him, and they wouldn't give that one to anybody. So yeah, I think there's masons in the church, no doubt about it. But we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the guy. Um, the secretary at the archdiocese said that archbishops and bishops have direct communication to the pope. Right? And the reason you need to go to the bishop is he's the ordinary who has executive power. Right? Executive power is through the ordinary. <clears throat> okay. What else was there? Uh, This is going on. Fatima. Pope Francis plans to take part in a mid-October Marian celebration that will commemorate the final apparition of Our Lady of Fatima and the 51st anniversary of the Second Vatican Council. The Pontifical Council for Promotion and New Evangelization organized the Marian weekend, the 12th and 13th, upon the request of then Pope Benedict. This event will mark the 51st anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council, as well as the date of the last apparition of the Virgin Mary at Fatima, Portugal. On October 13, 1917, Mary appeared for the sixth time to three shepherd children. During the apparition, the sun changed color, size, position for about 10 minutes, and has since been known as the Miracle of the Sun. Now, there happened to be 70,000 other people in the field watching this, it had rained all night the night before. The ground was a muddy frickin' mess with 70,000 drenched people standing there. This 10-minute thing happened, and when it was done, the ground was dry, and so were the people's clothes. Many people were healed of their illnesses. Yada, 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 yada. It was written in the newspapers. The theme of the Vatican gathering will be uh, Blessed Are You for Believing, and will include original statute of Our Lady of Fatima, which is being brought to St. Peter's Square and exposed for veneration. Uh, Pope Francis will consecrate the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary on October 13th. The consecration will take place. The part of the pilgrimage it will bring thousands of members of groups of promoting Marian piety to the Vatican. So, part of this, uh, the secrets of the of uh, Fatima is that um, the Virgin Mary specifically said that the Pope had to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. And if not, um, Russia would bring great evil on the world, and we went through everything that Russia means in communism, right, is because they hadn't done what they were supposed to do. 
consecrate Russia. And one of these secrets put, was put in an envelope to, op to be opened in 1960 and made public. And it never was. And they did a cover-up in 2000 where the guy that's sitting there as the Secretary of State of the Vatican is saying, you know, who I believe is a Mason and is actually the one running the Vatican on a day-to-day -day basis, is trying to uh, um, make their version of the story work. That the miracle was given and that anything else that wasn't given was really just this nun's thoughts, not really what the Virgin Mary had said. Uh, very strange. And, and then, not again, not strange, right, because it's prophecy and, and they're trying to keep that prophecy from happening, but it's going to happen anyways. And uh, another great one is this one on Our Lady of Guadalupe. There's two video videos. The Amazing and Miraculous Image of Our Lady of Guadalupe and Miraculous Image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Both of those are on YouTube. And that first one, the Amazing Miraculous Image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, they go through all the scientific anomalies of this picture that miraculously appeared on some poor peasant's um, outer garment that they wear, some kind of thing they use for a bedroll, such as there's no lines underneath it that, that you know, all artists draw a picture first and they paint over the picture. It doesn't have any brush strokes on it. It's on a material that will only, only normally last from agava plants, I guess, 10 to 15 years before it breaks down. This is over 500 years old. The thing keeps its own temperature at 98.6. When they look into the eyes, they see the same thing you would see if you were looking into a living eye. They've had optometrists go there with the same machinery that you would use to look in a human eye and look in the eyes of this painting and it looks the same. To, to the point that there's um, uh, reflections in the eyes and these reflections are the people standing in front of her at the time that this is happening. It's all quite amazing. Um, you know, I, I can see why they really want to put down the Virgin Mary. I never really understood it as a Catholic. What's wrong with you people? They're talking the Queen of Heaven. And that's why the the Masons have to destroy her. And so anybody who has hateful, hurtful feelings against the Virgin Mary, you know, you've been you've been touched by a demon. I'm afraid it's probably a Mason. Um. Then there was. Uh, So in 1929, uh, Vatican City State came back into uh, existence. And since 1929, a number of jurists have been surprised by some aspects typically not modern of Vatican City. Vatican City didn't want to be a modern state like the other states. Modern is not a good term because they are not reconciled with the logic of the state. The new institution born in the Lateran Treaty is not in condition to create a secular space, neutral, free by any possible conflict with the different Weshen Falligen, Shugen, Welt on Shogen, which is different worldviews, but on the contrary, it wants to be a legal apparatus for a specific religion and its organization. And we're the organization, the baptized Christians are. So they adopted the criminal justice system in Italy instead of writing their own to start with. And uh, the Vatican's promoter of justice has the authority to haul scoffles before the trial judge. Convicts can appeal to three judge tribunal and ultimately to somebody else. Uh, most convictions result in fines rather than confinement. Yeah, we're going to fine you your church property by excommunication. We're not going to confine you. You can go ahead and walk in the desert. You'll be stateless if they excommunicate you. So who's a promoter of justice? Is to be appointed in a diocese for contentious cases which can endanger the public good and for penal cases 
The promoter justice is bound by office to provide for the public good. So should be a guy in a diocese called the promoter of justice. However, that could be us. We're the promoter of justice. We're going to go point it out. We just want to know who to take it to. In contentious cases, it is for the diocesan bishop to judge whether or not a public good is can be endangered unless the intervention of the promoter of justice is prescribed by law or is clearly necessary from the nature of the matter. So, um, so anyways, this, these are just some cans talking about the promoter of justice, but the point is, right, it sounds like this is the person we would take our complaint to about some Christian being in a secret society, sitting there as a judge, judging you in a courtroom. Forget all that. He's a heretic, right? Ipso facto. He was excommunicated from, from the day he became a member and signed that frickin' oath. He was excommunicated. And so take his church property. He can't hold the office anymore. At least that's the way it looks to me. And I'm going to include a couple other things. This was, uh, I included this before, but it's worth doing again. This one here. I want to shut off. I'm gonna, probably going to lose you in a few minutes because we're almost done. But this is uh, 11 July 2013. It's going to explain more about the changes of the criminal procedure, including such things as enslavement. And... Um, this is what the popes had to say about uh, nat the natural system, which is really what the Masons are about, right? The great papal encyclicals. Don't have time to go through it now, but if you got a few minutes, it's worth a read. Okay, I got to go. See ya.